what, what we have done now, we have defined the process and now we have added one more definition to our vocabulary and that is a thermodynamic cycle. And it, this is nothing but a substance or a system that undergoes a series of processes but restores it back to the initial state. That these are such that from initial state it comes back to its initial state. So this is something we will come back again. Okay, there are some more questions, so let me take that. Please explain reversible process. Okay, good. I am about to come to that in a few minutes, so just have a little patience. In solar thermal power plants, how is heat stored in storages? Oh, okay. What happens here is very simple. What you do is, we take a material, and we don't call it heat storage, we will call it, strictly we should call it energy storage. And what we have done is that we basically do a very simple thing. That if I take something and put a pipe to this, through which I put steam generated by the solar system and out it comes. And this could have any material in it. It could be sand, it could be water. Then what have we done? We transferred energy to this. This material, its temperature went up. And then when we want this energy, we put in cold stuff in and get hot stuff coming out. But what we also use here, instead of sand or water, is what is called a PCM, a phase change material. It is nothing but some sort of a salt, where when you are heating it, it goes into liquid phase. And when you take the energy away from it, it comes back to solid phase. So during the heating phase, it goes from solid to liquid with very little temperature change. And when in the opposite thing, you are drawing energy out of it, it goes from liquid to solid. So that, that's what we do in energy storage. In isolated system due to work done, is internal energy will change or not? Okay, in an isolated system which is not in thermodynamic equilibrium, that is one thing. So we say that here is a system where say the pressure here was different than the pressure here. It is isolated. That means for this system boundary, Q is 0, W is 0. So what the question is, what will happen to the internal energy? Will, we have not yet defined internal energy. When we do that in the next module, we will answer this question at that point of time. But for now, we say that we made the system boundary and said that because it is isolated, during the process, that ever, whatever happens inside, heat and work are zero. That, that's coming from this. Okay, please explain reversible process. I'll come back to that in a minute. That is done. Energy of an isolated system is constant. Please give some practical examples and its uh, significance. Okay. One example I'll give and I'll tell you how pretty it is. And the example is of an isolated system. Okay, here is an example. Our country had a big problem. Now, you would still re realize that every now and then there is advertisement notices on the TV saying that this Sunday is polio Sunday, so bring your child and get the drugs. Now, that is important because our nation needs to eliminate polio. But to get those drops to each and every little corner village and house in the nation, that's not easy. Especially because those drops have to be stored below a certain temperature. And 
say 2 degrees Celsius or minus 2 degrees Celsius, something like that. And if during the transport of the drop from, say, the main storage to getting to the smallest town or community, this temperature goes beyond that, then that the active bacteria or what they call whatever in the vaccine, those die and the drop becomes useless. And that was what was happening several years back in our country and they said, look, we are giving drops but polio is not going away. Then we had to go back and say, look, when I transport this vaccine, I need to make a box. And in this, we put this medicine, which came from, say, a refrigerator where the temperature was quite nice and low. You always had electricity over there. Now remember that, that's so important. And then we put it in a box and cover it. And we would ideally like this inside system to be isolated. So that five hours, six hours during the transport of these, that there should be no heat input going in. The problem is much worse in our country, especially because our ambient temperatures are very high. So we would like to keep this system isolated, put as much insulation as is possible. But these days people have done one more trick that if this heat is going in, what they have done is they put some phase change material over there also, which was frozen when the box started. And as it went out, whatever heat got in, it melted this phase change material and kept inside thing at the temperature that it was stored in. And so that way, by the time we get to the remotest town, the vaccine is still preserved and then the whole program becomes very effective. So that, that's where, that's an example where isolated system is very, very important. Okay. Is electrical equilibrium a necessary condition for system to maintain thermodynamic equilibrium? Okay. We will come back to this a little later. I haven't defined electrical equilibrium yet. We will come back to that later. One more example and then we will continue. And this is a very, very different type of a thing. And what I have, I am showing you a picture here. The car is a very different type of a car. This car does not have an internal combustion engine. No diesel engine, no petrol engine, no CNG, none of that stuff. This is powered by a fuel cell. And there are a few companies whose advertisements you might have seen that you have a car that drives itself and all it produces is pure distilled water which you can even drink. And it is powered by a fuel cell. So let's see what is a fuel cell. Okay, here is a simple picture that tells us what happens inside a fuel cell. In the middle, we have what is, this is one type of a fuel cell called a proton exchange membrane. So there is a membrane there which is like a sheet of paper, 100 microns thick, maybe 200 micrometers thick of a particular material. On one side of this is the anode and the other side is the cathode. And in between this is a thin layer of a catalyst, 50 microns that type of a thing. And then around this is this device through which we can connect a supply of hydrogen into this and unused hydrogen comes out over there. And on the other side we have a similar thing here where oxygen or air is put in after cleaning it up and it goes in and comes out as air plus water vapor. What happens in this cell is that this hydrogen comes into contact with the anode. The electrons go out through a conductor into a circuit. The proton or the hydrogen nucleus goes through the membrane and comes into the cathode where it meets the electron coming from there and there is oxygen which has been broken up into O2 has gone into O plus O and so this H, O and electron combine to form H2O and that's what gives you the electricity. So what you need is a clean and reliable supply of hydrogen and ability to make this thing and a supply of clean air and all it gives us is, is H2, uh, is water. Efficiency of this cell is much higher. This particular picture says it is 40 to 60 percent compared to whatever else you have. Your engines are anything like 15, 20, 25 percent efficiency. That's all. 
this is much more efficient. Okay, so this is the basic construction, the basic physics underlying a fuel cell. And there are many, how do we make a fuel cell? And here is what we, one does. So from that basic physics, we now come to the engineering, where you got to put various thin membranes together, put gaskets to make it leak proof, make this device through which the gas can be fed over the entire face of the cathode and the anode. There are two end plates, so got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things all put together, sandwiched, put bolts through this and make it completely leak proof. That's how we get a fuel cell and this can be very, very small thing. You can hold it in one hand. And we put many of these things together and that is what we call a fuel cell stack. Here is a stack and this is a single cell, there is another cell, another cell. You build up more and more of these and you start increasing the power that you can generate. And once you have done that and you start making cells, you can start using it in various things. The, one of the applications here is charging your cell phone. This is a little thing which has got a fuel cell in it. You take a little sort of a pen type of a thing which has got hydrogen in it, stick into it and for many days, many months, you can keep getting electricity from this and keep charging it or do anything else with this fuel cell. When it is over, remove that cartridge, get another cartridge of hydrogen, but you need somebody who will sell you hydrogen. On a, Bigger scale, I just showed you a car, but here are people who have used a fuel cell to power a forklift truck. Or a bigger thing, here's the bus. So on the top, you have hydrogen supply, the fuel cell, the air conditioning unit, and is a bus which doesn't require oil or coal or electricity, generates its own electricity and produces water absolutely a clean way of doing it. Only catch is how do I get that hydrogen and how do I do the engineering of this and everything else in it. Or one can even put together and say look I will take a trailer and put into this and all you do is pick up this trailer on it, put it on a truck, take it where you want, connect it and you get electricity. You see this happening nowadays in many places. Every time you put up a tent or a shamiana, there are a whole bunch of the generators. They are all powered by diesel engine. You can have a fuel cell powered device, no noise, no pollution and reliable electricity. So people have been working on it and some big systems have come, have been commissioned. And that's what it shows that starting with that little physics, how big and complicated the engineering actually becomes. So while it is nice to get excited about technology, whether it is an electric car or a solar cell or fuel cell, Getting it to this point is a lot of hard work, takes many years and a lot of dedicated work and good engineering to make this whole thing work, work reliably because the customer doesn't want something that works for two days and then doesn't work on the third day, something that can work reliably for years at a stretch. And if it goes wrong, you need to have spare parts, you need to have a mechanic who will come and repair, then only you are happy with it. Many technologies fail because all of that doesn't get completely done. And what you saw in that fuel cell is that all the things that you have learnt in any of your manufacturing process, casting, welding, forming, whatever you did, all of that is practically useless. All of the material going in a fuel cell are very, very thin films whose thickness over the whole area has to be maintained very small, which has very thin coatings on it and you have to put these films together with no gap in between them, no air bubbles in them and then squeeze them together and make them in thousands over many square meters of cross-section. That is a big manufacturing challenge and this is one type of a machine which shows how the type of a membrane is being manufactured for a fuel cell. A completely different game that we are entering and we do that and as this chart shows, it is a, probably one of the most efficient technologies that we can get. So this again I have taken from the web, this is not my own creation. It tells you that if you take grid supply where 60-70% is coming from coal burning power plants or oil burning power plants, the he lower heating value efficiency is 33%, average US fossil fuel plant average efficiency is 36%. So do not think that if an Indian power plant is 35% efficient or 37% efficient, we are not really that bad off. We are pretty much the best in the world. How much NOx does it give? How much sulfur oxide are thrown out? 
PM10 particulate matter, we can even talk of PM2.5, how much particulate matter it throws up, how much carbon dioxide do we add to the atmosphere. And now we compare that with different type of a fuel cell, which is operating on natural gas with 47% efficiency, NOx is much less, SOx is practically unmeasurable, carbon footprint is one half. If this cell of natural gas is operated with a com combined heat and power cycle, we will come to that in a few lectures. Overall energy utilization efficiency is now 80 percent, carbon footprint 550 per energy that you use. And if we get it from biogas, which is that you treat sewage and get gas and clean it up and use it with a combined heat and power plant, 80 percent efficiency, very small amounts of emissions and we did not put any permanent carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at all. That's what actually makes sense where we have a country where we don't have toilets, we don't have sewage treatment systems, but if we put both those together, treat that sewage, get biogas and generate electricity from it, that would be a really great thing to do. That was a small application in between about a different type of a technology, but everything that deals with this, the reason for showing that here and bringing it up is that what we just talked about mass flow is that material crossing across the system boundary. That is mass flow, but if an electrical cable is cutting and coming into a system, then the cable is being cut here and if it then the electron flow through this, this is not mass transfer or not mass flow. The flow of electrons in the cable is in classical thermodynamics is not a mass. So we don't have to worry about it. How we will treat the fuel cell where the hydrogen nucleus enters the membrane? I leave it for you to think about it. How do we analyze the fuel cell? But why the fuel cell is more efficient than all the cycles that we will learn, or the answer lies in what we are learning, which is thermodynamics. And we will look at that also. The next thing that comes up, having defined this, is that if at any time, if there is a, what is now a change in the system, or change of state. We have defined the system, and at some instant of time, T1, its state is given by S T1, which is a set of properties. At a certain other instant of time, T2, its state is specified by another set of properties. So if the system has this state and something happens to it and it goes to this state, there has been a change of state. And this process of change of state is what is called a process or a thermodynamic process. Okay, so this is where we start to ask questions that state T1, the system was here and system is there but at some point at T2 something else is happening. When the system is in equilibrium, heat and work are not associated with it. Same thing here. So during the process what happened, we have interactions with the surroundings as heat and work and so we now associate heat and work with a process. And that is something we left unsaid yesterday is that heat and work that happen in it are denoted as Q1 to 2 or W1 to 2 and also by something else which is what we call a path. So path is a series of states between these states. So it started from here, then it went say incrementally to another state, another state, another state, another state and then it reached this state. The state at each one of these intermediate times and these two 
all of these together is what we call the path the path or the part of the process the process path and this can be defined only when every intermediate state can be defined which means that at every point here the system at that instant is in equilibrium or we assumed it as quasi equilibrium and we said that if i take very very small time steps it's going to be a big problem so even if we take a finite time step at which we look at the system and say whether this is yes or not then we say okay this is what is happening so process is the change of state of a system from one to the other there is no restriction whether this was a control mass control volume or a closed system or an open system but we said there is a change of state and if we know every intermediate state in between we can completely define the path if that is not the case then we cannot say what the path of the system was so if we know the path we could possibly also make a mathematical representation of it okay, so we define what is a process what is the process path and have we have already defined state and said that there are so many properties to it we'll just add one more thing to it before we move on just mention it is that the state which are defined by all these properties these properties can be interrelated to one another so that some property is a function of some other property and this is what we call equation of state and it tells you that there are so many independent states here and this is a dependent state and we have not come to that point but say look if I know so many how many minimum number of states do I need to know to fully define the state the equation of state tells you that okay if you tell me this many number of properties then using these equations you can get all the other properties so there is what we call a minimum number of properties or independent properties that need to be defined we get the state and that equation of state is applicable at every instant here that helps us when we come to solving problems so what we have done here is that if the initial state is known and the final state is known then to say what was the heat or the work associated with this process we also need to specify something more whether it was part A or whether it was part B. Sorry, A. If it went by another path, then it will be Q12 but with path B. If it was through another path, it could be path C. What we are saying is that a system can go from one state to the other state through many paths. And for each path, the heat and work associated with that path is going to be different. And just by knowing these two states, it is not enough to say what was heat and work in the system. Yeah, for that process, not in the system, what is the heat and work associated with the process? The process associated with two states. One we call this as the initial state T1 and one T2 as the final state. So to talk of a process in its completeness, we need to know what the initial state, what the final state and what was the path. Which is the set of intermediate states that the system went through to come from here to there. Okay, so now let's take an example or two. 
So there's a tube, and this is say we exposed to sunlight. So there is solar radiation falling on it, and we have water flowing through this the solar heater that you see in houses. And you said, well, my system boundary is going to be this. And we say that this is an open system, so I have to approach, use the control volume approach. What one does here when there is a flow across the system boundary, we define that and say that this is state 1. What we are in a way saying is that I have to take, take a very small amount of that material. And I say each state was 1 at the point where it entered the system. And this thing went through and say came out over there. And this we say is state 2. And the next element behind it comes in, it does the same change. The next one undergoes the same change. It goes through it, there is heat transfer to it, its temperature changes, pressure changes, something else may change. So what we have done in this is that when we have an open system or a control volume, with each mass inflow we associate a state at that point and with every mass outflow we associate a state. So that's how we take care of open systems. And this is what we will be doing to look at the control volume approach of analyzing such type of systems. Now this is quite different from that, say, a cylinder piston arrangement. We said that initially the piston was over there and then in the second state the piston was over there. So when we say that the position of the piston is here and this could be, say, the characteristic would be that we define the volume or we define this length, say this was L1 from here. And then it came down here and the, this length became L2. What happened here was the system that we defined in, at time T1 or at L, L1 at, at state 1. At state 1, this is the system. It has a certain volume and various other properties associated with that. When this piston went down over there, how it went, we, do, we are still not knowing about that. Once it got here, this is now state. Initial state, final state. And now what happened? It came to state 2. It was a closed system and now our system boundary becomes this. So in state 2, well, this much is the length, so you can associate a certain volume with it and then certain other properties with that. So state 2 gets defined and that's how we got defined state 1. And then in the same thing, we then try to calculate heat and work and like I said before, in this case, W12 will depend on what path it took, so would be Q12. And we would know how what happened in between at different lengths, positions, in order to be fully able to calculate this. Okay, so that's how we will treat open systems and closed systems in the analysis of control volume, and in this case we have the control mass approach. Okay, so We'll take an example now, say especially from this one, and then we'll come back and revisit the next part of this discussion. So we hmm. question. Okay, there's a question here. Is heat and work has any relation with thermodynamic? Equilibrium. Well, look, heat and work are associated with change of state.
which is the process. The only relation we can say is that during that process, if we know that the system is in thermodynamic equilibrium, then we can, using that data, calculate what was the heat and work associated with that process. That is the sort of relation that is there. The second question is, why is it said that heat cannot be stored in a system? Okay, we should go back and say that yesterday we defined what is heat in thermodynamics as we are discussing. And we said that it is that form of energy that transfers a system boundary because of temperature difference between the system and the surroundings. So heat in our definition is seen only at the system boundary as a energy flow. It is not something which is stored in the system because there is nothing crossing the system boundary. Then it is not heat. We will come back to it in the next module when we say that okay that is what it will be what we will call in broadly as energy. But right now we say that this is not heat. Heat is only at... Okay, so take an example and see what it, how, what we have been talking about to deal with this. This is a uh, newspaper has all these all over the place that yesterday our Prime Minister and the Russian President dedicated Kudam Kulam nuclear power plant to the nation and we are going to set up five more 1000 megawatt electric power output units and there is this picture over here which shows these two big buildings which are what is called the reactor building in which the nuclear part of it is kept. So, let's go back to Google Maps and see where is this place and what it's doing. So, this is a here and the, here is Kanyakumari. We are down at the tip of the Indian Peninsula and a little bit distance away from it, this is Kudankulam and that is about what about something like 15-20 kilometers and let's now zoom into it and let's see what do we see there. So here, here is what we see, that's the atomic power plant and we get uh, closer to this, we see a lot of other buildings here, we can see some things over here. There is a bit of water coming in over there and here are two buildings. These are two buildings, these are the reactor buildings. These two, these are the turbine hall and the accessories building. And so the generators will be there from which it will generate electricity and push it out. Yeah. So, is there. Okay, so how does this thing work? So what we are seeing is the reactor and then we have the turbine hall generating electricity. What else do we see on this? We see a big building here and this is another thing here and something else here you can see water coming out or going in into the power station. Here there is some more water being thrown out and it goes out there and here we have something else. You can see there is a sort of a little pond which has been made and the question is how does it produce electricity? It was, it went subcritical three years ago and finally yesterday it started generating power. So we look at the schematic of this and we say well how do I show what is there in a nuclear power plant. Okay and so say so this is the reactor building and we are now making just a sketch of this, doesn't matter what is inside it. And what it does is we pump in water and out comes steam, we just call it steam and in the process the pressure is about constant, the temperature increases and the liquid becomes a vapor. So all that this has done is that this water which went through this got heated and that heat came about from a material in which nuclear reactions are taking place. So this material got heated up, around it this water went, it picked up that heat, something happened and finally we got steam out of it. And then we take this steam and it is put into a steam turbine, the pictures that I showed you yesterday. The steam expands as it goes through this and exhausts. In the process, it drives a shaft 
which is coupled to a generator which produces electricity and it is sent into the grid. This steam which comes out here is it at a lower pressure and lower temperature and what one does is to put it in a device or in a condenser and in this case what the condenser has is that it will pump water, sea water into it, it goes through many many tubes and goes out and is discharged back into the ocean at some other place. So the temperature of this water rises typically by 7 to 10 degrees Celsius. And in the process this steam got condensed and we get liquid water there which is then pumped up back into the reactor. So what we see happening is that what I have shown here as lines are actually pipes. And the entire flow is driven by this pump which is powered by an electric motor. This gets electricity and power station, this pump is the biggest consumer of electricity and one of the biggest consumers of electricity in a grid is the thermal power plant itself. So some of this electrical power that was here came back in and it drove here and the other things that are required to keep a power plant going and that's about of the order of 7% of what we generate. So what we generate here, some came in and about 93% is exported which gives you your revenue. So these are pipes and like we just drew a few minutes back, say this is a pipe. And in this pipe, we got the substance flowing there. It was here, it flowed like this and comes over here. Then it's pushed in, something happens and then it comes out over there. Then it's pushed in into this and then it comes out into this and so it goes on. The thing is, let's make all the pipes first and then we will come back. So there's a pipe over there and then there is another pipe that brings it back over here. So this material, this substance moved, came here, got pushed into the pump, the pump pushed it out and it got pushed into this. What happens is that if you take any point, say this one, and say this is a point where the steam is just about to enter the turbine and I call this as state 1. Then it goes into this, undergoes a process in the steam turbine where there is work transfer and maybe some heat transfer and it comes out at state 2. So this is one process that is happening. And then this thing went into this, in a very small pipe, say nothing else happened, it came out at state 3. And then this went through the pipe, except for frictional pressure drop, nothing much happens there. It comes here, so it is state 3, we can assume it. And then it comes here and out in the pump, high pressure state 4. And then approximately the same state, at state 4 it enters this, comes out and comes here and if we ignore pressure temperature drops in this pipe, this is also state 1. And so it goes through this, goes through this and comes here and it is back at state 1. So it started with 1, changed 2, 3, 4, happened everything, came back to state 1. And so if this was process 1, 2, process 2, 3, process 3, 4 and back process 4, 1. So what we are seeing is that we went through a series of processes 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 1 and if we started with state 1, it came back to state 1. If we consider starting with state 2, it will come back to state 2 which means that this material went through a series of change of states and came back to its original state and this is the thermodynamic cycle. And that is of importance to us because this is a continuous process. As long as we keep giving heat and taking heat away and taking the electricity away from there, we can run this 24-7 non-stop for a long, long time. And that's what we want. And not just an intermediate process, 
We have said you just do it once and then okay now what do we do? How do I get back on? That becomes said that's not required. We want something which will be continuous. So this is the basic thing that is happening in that nuclear power plant. There's a nuclear reactor over there. In this you have the fuel rods in which we put some fuel and gradually that fuel underwent nuclear reactions. Nuclear reactions is not part of classical thermodynamics and so we do not go into this and what we learn in this cannot be applied to what happens inside this. For that we have to go to nuclear physics and that goes back to atom and molecule level phenomena. But just suffice to say that we had some particular atom, a neutron came and bombed it and this gave something plus something plus some more neutrons. So this atom disappeared, two new atoms appeared and maybe one or two or three more neutrons were produced. This is a nuclear reaction. We cannot study this from what we have learned because here the energy that comes out is associated with the loss of mass. And that is something we decouple in classical thermodynamics and say so that even when energy is released by the combustion of gases, mass is still conserved. 